Welcome to Lower Ghost Goths and Ghouls, an audio tour. Beneath the granite monument in front of City Hall in Lowell are the remains of three of the first four men to be killed in the Civil War. Two were young mill workers named Luther Ladd and Addison Whitney. In April 1861, they left Lowell with the 6th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry Regiment just days after the surrender of the Union garrison of Fort Sumter in South Carolina. On their way to Washington, D.C. to answer President Lincoln's call for more volunteer troops to put down the Confederate rebellion, soldiers were met by a mob of angry civilians in Baltimore, Maryland. During the altercation, Ladd, Whitney, and two of their fellow soldiers, including Charles Taylor of Boston, also buried here, were killed. Four years later, the city erected this monument in their honor. Among those who worked on the monument was a young man named Alden Davis. He was most likely there at the dedication, which was a big day in Lowell. The festivities may also have brought out young Honora Kelly, an 11-year-old orphan indentured in service to a local family, the Toppins. But whether or not their paths crossed that day, among the happy crowds gathered for the marching band and speeches, they most certainly did in 1901 under vastly different circumstances. By then, Alden was a successful businessman in the railroad industry, living on Cape Cod with a wife and two grown daughters. And Honora, renamed Jane Toppin as a child, had poisoned more than 20 people. Madness ran in Jane's blood. Her father, Peter, an abusive alcoholic who gave her and her sister away to the Boston female asylum as children, later sewed his own eyes shut and was institutionalized. After she found stability in the Toppin home, Jane was often verbally abused by her foster mother, who never formally adopted her. And she grew to hate her foster sister, Elizabeth. Although she was kinder than her mother, Elizabeth was beautiful and admired. Everything Jane was not. Jane may not have been beautiful, but she was smart and mischievous. In the Lowell Sun story about her death, she was remembered as brilliant and aggressive in all things. Upon turning 18 and graduating from high school, she was given $50 from the Toppins as per her indentured agreement. She stayed with the family for a decade, working for Elizabeth and her husband, Oramel Brigham, the deacon of a local church. In 1885, Toppin left Lowell for Cambridge Hospital, where she trained to be a nurse. She was popular and fun, and it was here that she picked up her nickname, Jolly Jane. It was also here that she developed a taste for killing, began experimenting on elderly, very sick patients using varying doses of morphine and atropine to witness the effects on their nervous systems. She enjoyed spending time alone with them, watching them drift in and out of consciousness and even getting into bed with them. She became a private nurse in 1891 after both Cambridge Hospital and Massachusetts General Hospital dismissed her for recklessly dispensing opiates. Now that she was freelance, her true calling became even easier. She moved to the Cape, and in 1895, she killed her landlord. She lived with his wife for more than two years, and then killed her. She killed patients and an old friend whose job she wanted. Four years later, she finally got a revenge on her dear foster sister Elizabeth. The women went for a picnic on Buzzards Bay, and Jane served her sister cold corned beef, taffy, and mineral water laced with strychnine. Jane later confessed that I held her in my arms and watched with delight as she gasped her life out. Then she poisoned Elizabeth's housekeeper and her new landlords, but only enough to make them ill so that she could nurse them back to health. And their housekeeper, just enough to make her appear drunk so that Jane could steal her job. It worked. But even as her body count rose, no one ever suspected that Jane was guilty of crimes more serious than a little petty theft here and there. Her success made her feel a sense of invincibility that led her to her most audacious act, killing four members of a single family in a little more than a month. She rented a cottage for the summer from her fellow former Llewellyn, Alden Davis, and befriended his family. Wife Maddie was the first to taste Jolly Jane's special mineral water when she came to collect the rent money. Poor Maddie took seven days to die but Jane was there at her bedside to soothe her and take away her pain. Jane then moved in with the grieving widower Alden to take care of him. In quick succession, he and his daughter Genevieve were dead. Jane asked the surviving daughter Minnie to forgive Jane's debt to the family. She didn't, and so she followed the rest of her family to their active cemetery plot thanks to morphine administered by Nurse Toppin. As Minnie died, Jane sat by her bedside holding the woman's 10-year-old son. Jane asked Minnie's husband if she could stay on as his housekeeper. 
Lucky for him and his son, he declined. Jane didn't waste any time grieving the Davises. She was soon back to Lowell, hoping to work her way into the affections of her foster sister's widower, Oramel. She killed his sister to get her out of the way and stepped in as caretaker when, when Oramel came down with an illness that no one diagnosed as mild poisoning. But back on Cape Cod, someone finally got suspicious. Minnie's father-in-law wondered how a healthy young woman and her entire family could die so suddenly. He called in a toxicologist and had the bodies exhumed. Jane's luck had finally run out. Oramel threw her out of the house when she tried to get him to marry her, and just a few weeks later, she was arrested for murder. When news of her crimes got out, a woman named Amelia Finney recalled something that happened while she was a patient at Cambridge Hospital in 1887. After her surgery, Nurse Toppin had given her some bitter-tasting medicine. As she drifted into sleep, Jane had climbed into bed with her and began to kiss and fondle her. Amelia thought it had been a dream. It wasn't. Lucky for Amelia, someone else came into the room before Jane had time to curl up next to her and hold her as she died. Jane's favorite sexual thrill. After her arrest, Jane told her lawyer that she killed 31 people, but later said it could have been as many as 100. At the end of her eight-hour trial on June 23, 1902, Jane was declared not guilty by reason of insanity and sentenced to Taunton State Hospital for life. In court, Jane argued for her own sanity. She knew what she was doing, she said, and she knew that it was wrong. Yet she did it anyway. Why did she do it? She claimed that her murderous streak sprung from being jilted in romance at age 16. She loved a young man who worked in an office in Lowell. He gave her a promise ring engraved with a bird. But then he fell in love with another woman. I still laughed and was jolly, but I learned how to hate, too, she said. If I had been a married woman, I probably would not have killed all these people. Jane lived out the rest of her days in the Taunton Asylum, where she died at the age of 81 in 1938. In her later years, she grew increasingly deranged and paranoid and claimed in letters that the hospital staff was poisoning her. There ain't no grave can hold my body down. There ain't no grave can hold my body down. When I hear that trumpet sound, I'm gonna rise right out of the ground. Ain't no grave can hold my body down. Well, look way down the river. What do you think I see? I see a band of angels and they're coming after me. Ain't no grave can hold my body down. Ain't no grave can hold my body down. Gabriel, put your feet on the land and see. But Gabriel, don't you blow your trumpet till you hear from me. Ain't no grave can hold my body down. Ain't no grave can hold my body down. Well, meet me, Jesus, meet me. Meet me in the middle of the air. And if these wings don't fail me, I'll meet you anywhere. Ain't no grave can hold my body down. Ain't no grave can hold my body down. Well, meet me, mother and father. Meet me down the river road. And mama, you know I'll be there when I check my load. Ain't no grave can hold my body down Ain't no grave can hold my body down Ain't no grave can hold my body down